This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain the negativity of human emotions and how our vulnerability can be groomed to serve a debatable purpose. The Empty Man is a 2020 mind-boggling supernatural horror thriller that serves as David Pryor's directorial debut. The film is a sleeper hit and has grown a cult following since its release. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. In 1995, a group of four friends hike through the frosty mountains of Bhutan. A truck carrying Buddhist monks passes them by, indicating that there must be a monastery nearby. Going further, they find a bridge made of wire mesh and cross it with nervous excitement. On the other side, they feast on the breathtaking scenery before their eyes. This is how day one starts, with the foreboding weather. Greg tells everyone that they should head down. However, Paul interrupts him, shushing him because he heard something. Strangely enough, only Paul seems to hear it. The peculiar sound draws him in its direction until Paul falls down a crevice. In a panic, his friends try to get him out. Greg repels down the fissure, calling out to Paul. He doesn't respond, but Greg finally finds his friend sitting motionless. Still unresponsive, he draws closer, only to be greeted by a massive, perfectly preserved skeleton seemingly plastered onto the wall. He takes a closer look, figuring out that the bones don't seem human. After a few seconds, Greg points his flashlight back at Paul, who is still staring at the skull in silence. He mumbles that if Greg touches him, he'll die. Greg hesitates for a moment, but he eventually taps his friend's shoulder. Paul closes his eyes, looking as though all hope had drained out of him. He starts sobbing, gasping for air as his tears keep falling. Greg tries to calm him down gently at first, but seeing as Paul refuses to cooperate, he becomes more insistent, forcibly taking Paul out of the cave. We can sense that these two men have a strong bond. Whatever Paul was afraid of, he didn't want Greg to be a part of it. He warned him firmly, and Greg didn't listen. It seemed like a bad omen judging from how Paul's expression changed. For Greg, saving Paul was a priority. He was more level-headed and acted rationally given the situation, even perhaps thinking those words meant nothing at all. The weather starts picking up, but Ruthie was able to find a small old house nearby. They settle Paul in, trying to check him for insect bites and physical injuries. Ruthie realizes that Paul is clutching something in his hand. She casually throws it away. Greg tells Ruthie that Paul might be in shock. He tries to nudge his body parts, hoping for a response. Here, Greg finds the scars on Paul's wrists. He asks Ruthie how Paul is lately, and she insists that he's been okay and starts whimpering. In another room, Fiona and Greg try to think of what could have caused Paul's shock. Since there were no injuries to his head, they need a scan to be sure. Greg doesn't rule out the possibility that his friend is sick in the head. This shows us that Greg thinks Paul might have been recently unstable. Judging from how Ruthie reacted earlier, it seems that she didn't want to make a big deal out of it. But those scars seem fresh, and something must have happened to Paul quite recently. As for Ruthie, it's understandable that she's scared and concerned, but her thoughts and actions have no better judgment, wanting to leave the cabin to get Paul treated immediately. Unfortunately, they are miles away from civilization, and the snowstorm doesn't help at all. Greg suggests that they watch over him for the night, and that he'll hike down for help in the morning. While watching over her lover, Ruthie picks up the object that Paul was holding earlier. It resembled a flute, so she blew into it, drawing out a deep, yet hollow tune. Just then, she heard footsteps. Thinking it might have been her companions, she opened their room, only to find Fiona and Greg sound asleep. Day two, and the snowstorm hasn't settled down. While Greg and Fiona go out for help, Ruthie finds a shadow outside their cottage. She immediately calls the stranger for help, but something feels odd. The cloaked figure runs toward Ruthie in a flash, and she immediately dashes back to the cottage, locking the door. The number of days seems to be an essential part of the story, given how it shows up on the screen. Maybe this was also presented as a reminder, since one could quickly lose track of time, especially in the wilderness. Time is one of those concepts that spring from an ancient origin, and we use it every day. Yet it's also something we ignore, until it confronts us. It's pretty ironic. The banging on the wood doesn't stop, and Ruthie arms herself with a knife, screaming for it to go away. But a familiar voice comes from the other side. Greg keeps knocking, asking her to open up. They tell her they saw no one there, but Ruthie goes hysterical, saying they need to leave. Day turns to night and things get weirder. We find Ruthie asleep, and this time, Paul is whispering something indiscernible into her ear. She wakes up in the morning to find Paul missing. Fiona notices Paul's jacket is gone, and the trio decides to follow him outside. On the morning of day three, they find Paul sitting in the middle of nowhere, blowing the flute he got inside the cave. Greg asks him what he's doing, but Paul keeps quiet, looking straight ahead as if he didn't hear him. This time, Greg snaps. He rants about how everything turned out wrong because of Paul. Fiona tries to calm him down, but Greg doesn't budge. Just then, Paul looks up to his friend telling him, I told you. Greg looks at him puzzled. Notice how the atmosphere changes. Their great friendship seems to have been stained throughout the years, and the truth is finally out. Greg has thought of Paul as a special snowflake, and admits that he's tired of the latter's antics. All this time, 
He's been walking on eggshells around him. In turn, Paul reminded him of what Greg might have thought of a silly warning earlier, suddenly feels like a threat. Just then, Ruthie pulls out a knife from her sleeve, stabbing Greg in the back and pushes him off a cliff. Greg falls to his death, and Fiona meets her demise just as quickly. After killing off their friends, Ruthie stares at Paul, walking inches toward the precipice, until she too ultimately does away with herself. At the end of it all, we see Paul unperturbed as he brings the flute to his lips, drawing out a sound that has become an urban legend to the film's present day. Fast forward to 2018, we see James LaSombra jogging through his neighborhood in Missouri. We can hear a mumbling voice asking, where were you, a few times over, and James speeds up, running faster. It's quite interesting how the narration starts off with this creepy introduction. Right at the beginning, it tells the viewers that something huge has already happened. If this is some sort of hallucination, then we're already given a glimpse of the main character's mental state. Could he be running away from something? We'll have to keep our eyes peeled. After closing his shop, we see James dining alone in a restaurant. He pays using a birthday coupon and ends up getting greeted by the staff. He face palms in embarrassment. Coming home, he finds someone in his backyard, a young woman named Amanda. The way she talks and checks up on him makes it clear that they're close. She starts talking about the events of the past, the death of her father, as well as Allison and Henry, and how she tries to cope with it. She starts philosophizing about the powers of positive and negative thinking, and the origin of people's thoughts. Then, she goes down into some sort of fantastical nihilistic explanations about how nothing is real in the world. James tells her he doesn't know what she's talking about, but Amanda says he does. Their conversation is cut short by a phone call from Amanda's mom, and she says goodbye. The night passes, and James wakes up from his nightmares. These are images of his good memories of his wife and kids, and then it abruptly changes into flashes of light, along with a woman's shrill scream. He wakes up, then goes to the bathroom to take his meds. We see it's also where he keeps his wedding ring. Looking back, Allison and Henry must have been his wife and son. The nightmare shows us snippets of what happened to them, presumably an accident. James is still grieving his loss, and perhaps is still carrying some guilt. As to why we all need to pay attention, however, it all seems deeply rooted for him to go as far as taking medication. The setting changes to a quaint house, marked day one. Here we can see what happened in 1995 is about to repeat itself. Amanda's mom, Nora, calls her daughter, but she doesn't reply. James knocks on her door, and we can guess that something happened to Amanda and that her mother called James for help. They hug each other. James examines Amanda's room and sees a note written in blood in the bathroom mirror. After a while, the police arrive and start investigating. One officer recognized that James used to be a cop. As one of them goes through Amanda's things, we can see that the young woman has a penchant for the rather dark, edgy stuff. The police tell Nora that Amanda is a legal adult and may have left, but Nora believes otherwise. After the police left, Nora and James knew that they couldn't rely on the police to look for Amanda. He checks Amanda's desk and finds a flyer for the Pontifex Institute. The word Tulpa was written behind it. He secretly pockets it as Nora talks about the situation, and to assure her, James decides to take matters into his own hands. Throughout the whole scene, we see the support James is offering to Nora. We learn that they were neighbors before and family friends, but their body language suggests a deeper bond. It's slightly awkward, yet intimate at the same time. Perhaps it's their loss that brings them together. After the deaths of their loved ones, it seemed that they only had each other to lean on. James waits outside Amanda's high school and calls out a student named Davara. He invites her for a chat in his car and he secretly records their conversation. They talk about Amanda, but Davara looks out of the car window to see a shadow hovering in the air, unbeknownst to others, but the apparition disappears abruptly. James brings up the empty man, but Davara says it's childish. The legend of the empty man starts with going to a bridge after dark. There, if you find an empty bottle and blow into it, then something could happen. Then, Devara discloses that they had tried this trick in Rock's Bridge two days ago. Amanda was the one who initiated it. While walking on the bridge, she encouraged her friends to try and they blew into it one by one. Through it all, Devara was hesitant, but she went along anyway. She also mentions that the last time that she saw Amanda was at the mall. Devara saw her talking to Brandon, but she didn't approach her. We see how this is a replica of what happened in 1995. The bridge and the sounds invoked the empty man, and he comes for those who call him. In the same manner, the number of days also matters. If we look back, Paul woke up the second day and whispered things into Ruthie's ear. In the same gibberish manner, Amanda whispered to Brandon. The third day is upon them, and time is running out. James dropped by Brandon's house next, only to find that he was missing too. After that, he visited another one of Amanda's friend's houses, Lisa's. There was no one at home, but he found flyers for the Pontifex Institute sitting on the table as well as a dead golden retriever in the backyard. They might have used the dog's blood to write that message on Amanda's bathroom mirror. He tries to locate all the other kids, but all of them have disappeared. After getting no leads as to the rest of Amanda's friends, he asks Nora if Amanda was ever into weird stuff and mentions the Pontifex Institute. 
Nora seems to be clueless about the whole thing. James gets out of his car and walks to the bridge. He finds a bottle, picks it up, and blows into it. After that, he throws the bottle away and keeps walking. He looks around and sees an open manhole. There, he finds Amanda's friends hanging dead, and the same message, the empty man made me do it, comes into view. As the police retrieve the bodies, James takes out the Pontifex Institute. A drop of blood falls onto it, coming from James's nose. The next scene takes us to a spa room where Devara is taking a bath. While the steam fogs up in the shower, a shadow grabs Devara by the neck and starts stabbing her face with a pair of scissors. It turns out that there was no shadow at all, and it was Devara who did this horrendous thing to herself. She falls to the floor and sees the empty man looming over her in her final moments. Devara's demise opens a lot of questions. It shows James that the empty man does exist, but it also complicates the case. The can't just point fingers at some urban legend. It also paints the victim negatively because the only way to explain the situation was that she took her own life, just as the kids on the bridge did when they hanged themselves. It all becomes a question of their sanity. There could be no other plausible explanation. Back home, James listens to a secret recording of Devara. Then he researches the Pontifex Institute. Results come up with dubious content. Then, he searches for the word tulpa, which seems to be flesh made out of thought, concentration, and time. As he tends to his bloody nose, Nora drops by, bringing him food. She tries to act normally, but starts breaking down. She apologizes for bringing James into her problems. James hugs her, and we can see their relationship in a clearer light. How James comforts her, and how they seem to yearn for each other. We can deduce that they were in a secret relationship before, but they both knew they had boundaries. In the end, Nora leaves. James continues to have the same fragmented dream, but it also becomes more apparent as the story progresses. It's a nightmare of events that led to his wife and son's accident, as well as an old empty chair. He also wakes up at the same time, at 3.03 a.m. He hears a sound and takes his baseball bat in case there's an intruder. When he turns on the lights, he sees that his front door is open, but there is nothing else. The next day, he visits the Pontifex Institute's meeting place. They seem to be dedicated to helping people discover their deepest selves. A lady gives him a questionnaire, and he finds the question somewhat ridiculous. Ignoring it, he slips into a lecture hall where they talk about how loss is basically non-existent, and all man needs is himself. We can consider that the Pontifex Institute teaches nihilistic views. Nihilism is a philosophical belief that nothing can be known and communicated, and therefore, all things are useless. This is also repeated numerous times in the lecture. If you can remember, Amanda also shared this with James early on. James, however, is a skeptic, and this lecture wasn't very convincing. As with the questionnaires, he thinks this is nonsense until the lecturer mentions the empty man and how he will unify people to discover the truth of life. After the lecture, he walks over to the speaker to ask him about the empty man. It is revealed that the followers of the empty man believe that there is a place where all our thoughts come from, the new sphere, which also houses a collective unconscious. He highlights the relationship between distraction and focus, technology and memory, and repetition and comprehension. Basically, the empty man holds more meaning simply because it corrodes anything one might think of as valuable through trivial things. The speaker tells him it was nice to see him again, but James says it was his first time there. He gets some refreshments and tries to ask a guy if he's seen Amanda, but he denies it. James instantly knows that he's lying. He sneaks into the back and finds himself entering a room full of beds. It seems to be a living quarter, and he finds men in a trance-like state, listening to a repeated audio mantra, not even noticing his presence. Voices lead him through a vast space where people also chant the exact phrases over and over. Calling out, they blow into empty bottles. As he observes them, he is found out by the Pontifex people and is escorted out of the building. Clearly, the Pontifex group has the makings of a cult. Cults are formed through the unity of people worshipping a radical person or idea, which in this case, is the empty man. While nihilism isn't a particularly new idea, they take it to the extremes. That's what makes it different from the old religion. With cults, people are brainwashed and indoctrinated, just like what the Pontifex Institute is doing. Outside, the man he asked about Amanda earlier reveals that Amanda is one of the organization's most valuable members. He adds that these people are on a whole new level and that they're dangerous. After the conversation, James heads for camp elsewhere. At Elsewhere, James finds files for all of Amanda's friends. Surprisingly, he finds a red folder with his name. He opens it, but there's nothing inside. In another cabin, he sees an old, dirty stuffed toy and some VHS tapes. The tapes recorded another session of the Pontifex mantras, and it shows that nothing had changed from how they did things. Farther into the video, he sees a man, skin and bones, trying to paint something on the wall. He realized that this was the same room that he was in, and the portrait was still there. When he gets out, it was already dark. He catches sight of a group of hooded people dancing around a huge bonfire. They notice him and chase him out of the woods. James goes straight to the police station to report what he saw and share the files he took. The chief questioned his acts because he was breaching investigation protocols, especially since he wasn't a cop anymore. 
He visits Nora and tells him what he found about the Pontifex Institute and that Amanda may have joined a cult. It's dangerous and they need to leave. Nora's afraid her daughter might be dead, but James assures her. Then, he asks if Amanda knows what's going on between them. Nora says she hasn't told her anything. Now, it is clear that the two did have an affair. This explains the tension between them and how their body language speaks awkward attachment. We can deduce that the accident left them both jaded. Perhaps that might be the reason they haven't contacted each other in so long. However, it's clear that they both still have feelings for each other. Nora's been reaching out to him all this time, but perhaps James is still gripped by guilt over his wife and son's accident. At 3.03 a.m., James wakes up from the same nightmare. The fragments show more of his memories of the night that his family perished. It shows that he was with Nora the night that it happened, and perhaps that's why the question, where were you, kept resounding in his conscience. He wasn't there when they needed him. Suddenly, he hears something creak. As he stares at the door, a shadow appears and instantly comes after him. However, it disappears instantly, leaving nothing but the old, tattered teddy bear from camp elsewhere. The next day, he tails the Pontifex followers to a hospital. There, he found an old bedridden man in the ICU, and his followers bow before him. Soon after, he kidnaps the same guy from the Pontifex and asks him about the man in the hospital. Everything the guy tells him is the same. He transmits, we receive. The guy highly philosophizes the collection of thoughts in the new sphere, and that one special man can be a bridge to all others. Fed up with all of it, James punches the man right in the face. At night, he goes back to the Pontifex building. In the storeroom, he checks files under the Manifestation 14 folder. He flips through the images of the bedridden man, and underneath it, he finds a shocking revelation. A red folder bears information about him, his birth, his family, the tragic accident, and even the birthday coupon he used at the beginning of the film. He couldn't believe his eyes, especially after seeing a photo of himself sitting on a chair, the same empty chair he had seen in his nightmares. There are two things that we can take from this disclosure. First, James certainly might have been there before, and this was all his history recorded from his sessions. It's not clear if he simply forgot. Second, the Pontifex Institute might be onto him, and they're collecting as much information on him as they can. Do they consider him an enemy? Anything is possible at this point. On the way to the hospital, James's mind is jumbled up, as if all of the events of the past and the recent happenings blend together. We can see him hearing repeated words, making repeated habits, and everything is all a mess. As he walks inside the ICU, he finds Amanda sitting on the bed, giving the bedridden man's beard a trim. He questions him about the guy, but Amanda doesn't give him a name, only that he is a carrier. James digs out his phone to call Nora, and tells her he found her daughter, but the person on the other line seems to be oblivious, cutting him off. Puzzled, James roughly asks Amanda what's going on. Here, it is revealed that the old man on the bed is Paul, and he had been the empty man since his encounter with the skeleton in Bhutan 23 years ago. However, his aging body is too weak to handle the signals and transmit them, so the Pontifex Institute decided to make another empty man. James. James. Lashes out, cursing Amanda. He is writhing on the floor in pain, but Amanda continues to explain that his life was all made up. The Pontifex Institute had written an entire biography for him to live out. Everything from his birth, education, secret affair with Amanda's mom. All of it was a script written for him, and the life he felt that he's been living for years has, in fact, only been for a mere three days. Amanda happily tells him that he's their tulpa, the flesh made of thoughts, concentration, and time. He is the next empty man vessel. It's important to note that the Pontifex Institute failed before, but they concocted a perfect recipe. James might have been an entirely different person before all of this, but it all means nothing now. We might not have been given a detailed background of Paul and James, but one thing's for sure, they're both vulnerable men. When people go through a difficult situation, bearing grief, guilt, or depression, they become helpless and desperate. Perhaps that's why James went to the Pontifex Institute in the first place. He must have been seeking consolation, and the cult saw it as an opportunity. The following scenes unfold in fast-changing transitions, making us question whether this was all in James's head or not. He is staring at an empty chair, which is then transformed into the cave from the story's beginning. The empty man chases James and ultimately bonds itself with him. Snippets of the past unfold as James runs back home. Back then, at Nora's husband's funeral, his wife and kids drive home without him. As the accident took place, he was spending an intimate time with Nora. He finds his own house empty, and in one of the rooms, there's Paul on the stretcher with his eyes open. This time, James shoots him multiple times, blood splattering on the wall. He finally walks out of the ICU to see doctors and nurses staring at him. James eyes them with seriousness that was never there before, as if he is sure of what is happening now. The lights go dim, and the people in front of him drop to their knees. The empty man is highly philosophical in nature. There are a lot of references to different ideologies, such as existentialism and religion. At one time, we learn that Amanda goes to Jacques Derrida High School, which also points us to the idea of deconstruction. Deconstruction aims to erase the hierarchy created by binary concepts, such as right and wrong, good and bad, real and unreal, and in turn, question their true nature. In a similar view, we understand that the Pontifex Institute needed to build James only to tear him down. This was done through a lot of repetition, 
his tick-like habits, his recurring dreams, the answers people tell him over and over, all led him to a complete breakdown of himself, rendering him an empty shell, thereby achieving their goals. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.